It's Torah talk. 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 We are witnesses and watchmen of Torah. Welcome to Torah Talk with Lou White and Mark Davidson. A Torah Institute podcast. <laughs> it's the Torah Zone. Brothers and sisters, welcome back to the Torah Institute. Today we're looking at the Nazarim. Who are they? Are you one of them? What does it mean to be a Nazarim? And what really went down in real history? Welcome to Torah Talk, brothers and sisters. My name is Mark Davidson and I'm joined with the wonderful Lou White. How are you, brother? Hi, I'm fine. Thank you. It's good to see you. Yeah, you too, mate. It's, like it's been a while. I've been doing a lot of studying. Yeah. You know. So what do we want to discuss today? Uh, a little history on the Nazarene? Yeah. You know, Wonderful. I was coming across the, uh, well, in reading some of the texts for observing Passover uh, this past few days, uh, well, we came across Yahukanen or John chapter 17. Mm -hmm. And in John chapter 17, there's a marvelous thing. I'd like to read it. Go for it, brother. Read it out. Oh, well, I'd love to start with that. Yeah. Let me let me find it so I can get it. Uh, mm. Now, opening up, as original followers of Yahusha, a lot of people don't know this, but there was a sophist whose name was Tertullus. And I, I think in the last seminar, I called him Tertullian, and that was a circus father. But their names are so similar, I get them confused. But anyway, in the book of John, chapter 17, or Yehuchan, I think it's about verse 6. Yahusha is praying to the Father the, the, the night before, the, actually it was the day of his suffering, the 14th of, 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 of uh, Abib, the first month of the year. And he was praying, and one of the phrases jumped out at me. He was talking about his followers that he was with then, and he was saying he was praying for those who would believe in him through their word. And that, of course, Christians would be included in that. But he was uh, specifically talking about something that we always talk about. We talk about his name and his word, how we guard those things. You know, guard them as guardians. The Nazarene mean guardians. Uh, watchmen or branches of his teachings. Well, here's what it says in chapter 17, verse 6. I have revealed your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have guarded your word. And I thought that was unbelievable. It just jumped right out at me. You know, when I was reading, you know, for a uh, the texts that were pertinent to his death, you know, the time of his death. Because we remember his death every year at Passover. Mm -hmm. And then it reflects Psalm 138, verse 2. I bow myself towards your set-apart heckle and give thanks to your name for your kindness and for your truth. For, they, for you have made great your word, your name, above all. And it's just, you know, amazing. I thought it was really wonderful. Why were the true followers of Yahusha called Nazarim? Why the term Nazarim? Foremost, it is prophetic. We are described as a remnant of the scattered tribes by many prophets, but in the last days we are called by the term Nazarim as we cry out on the hills of Ephraim. 
And you can see that at Jeremiah 31 verse 6. And it says, For there shall be a day when the watchmen cry on Mount Ephraim, Arise and let us go up to Zion, to Yahuwah our Elohim. The word watchman in that scripture is the Hebrew word Nazarim, and it means guardians, protectors, preservers, and also means branches, as in descendants. Immediately, we see the connection with Yahusha's words about him being the root and his students being the branches, the offspring of his teachings. The name by which we are called has no Greek roots. The Hebrew roots of our name are actually profound because we guard Yahuwah's name and his word, the covenant with Israel. Of course, the new covenant is given in that same chapter mm. where actually uh, uh, the reuniting of the houses of Yisrael and, and Yehuda are accomplished and he makes a new covenant or a renewed covenant with us writing his Torah on our hearts. And that's amazing. He says he's going to sow us first and then into the nations. But uh, anyway, we're we're doing everything that he said we were supposed to be doing. Yes. You know. Huh? And we're called this. Not serene. Yeah. And, and on the back of uh, the cards, it's, we even we even recite Deuteronomy chapters 4 and 5. Where, where the covenant's giving, given, and he also prophesies that we'd be scattered. But then where we're scattered to, we'd be regathered uh, from that place. But we'd first come upon his word. And then in Deuteronomy 30, it talks about us too. You know, the whole chapter, really, you know. <laughs> and, the, you know, people don't realize that Israel is going to be in a covenant relationship with him forever. And he even refers to that. Eternal covenant that he's going to guard in, in, in Yermiyahu 31 also. So all those things are con constantly being referred to by us. Yeah. And why would we do that? You know, mm. Not that it's better, but that we're, but we're, we're Torah teachers and we're, we're being raised up in the last days by the spirit of Yahushua. Mm. Go out and search for those people hiding under those rocks and <laughs> dig them out of there and say, get out of there, get, <laughs> come on to this wedding feast. You know. In the last days, during the great distress, we will have a literal glow about us when the sun darkens and the moon glows blood red. People will be howling in all the lands. You think you've seen it happening in the world now? It's just going to get worse and worse and worse. The powers of the heavens will be shaken because there will be a changing of the guard taking place referred to as birth pangs. The powers currently having sovereignty over the earth, they're going to be shaken from their moorings when the children of Yahuwah, and that's the Nazarim, when they're finally revealed, and the universe groans in expectation of our birth. We have been begotten from above, but our actual birth will occur at the return of our creator Yahusha, Hamashiach, after the distress of those days. So brothers and sisters, despite what you might have heard in uh, religion, we're not actually born again yet. So the whole massive movement of born again this and born again that and hallelujah da da da, we're not even born again until the end when Yahushu comes back and we're transformed. That's when we're born again. So that puts a bit of a perspective on that spin for you. What is the truth about us though? If you felt like you've been drawn out of religion and as scripture says come out from among them if you've been drawn out and not quite sure what you've been drawn out into then this is going to be really an eye-opener for you today we were given the commission to teach all nations to obey all that we ourselves were commanded to obey we occupy our post protecting what we were commissioned to cherish the thing we guard is not only discarded as rubbish by most, but it is the reason that we are so despised. So if you want to know why you're so despised and that pressure coming on you, stay tuned. What we are commonly called is misspelt Nazarenes, but it's actually in the Hebrew Nazarim. 
We are a sect. Yes, we are actually a sect named for the original followers of Yahushua of Nazareth. Nazarim, Nazareth. Makes sense, doesn't it? See Acts 24 verse 5. Over the many centuries, we are those he has chosen and written his Torah upon our hearts. That's us. Over the centuries, he's chosen us and put his Torah. He's written it on our hearts. Yahushua is the real name of Israel's Mashiach, undefiled by Greek. So the closest pronunciation of your Creator's name, Yahuwah, and His Son is Yahusha. We are guardians, since Nazarim literally translates as watchmen, guardians, protectors. It also means branches, as in offspring or descendants. The idea of branches being offspring or descendants indicates that we are continuing contact with the root. So we live in the teachings that provide the nourishing life that the root provides. And that life, of course, is Torah, Scripture, the covenant, which Yahushua HaMashiach brings to us, since He is the living Word. His presence within us enables us to walk in the Spirit, having His perspective instead of that of our natural mindset. Our natural mindset does not submit to Torah, nor can it. We are referred to as first fruits, having been sealed with the Father's name, and that, of course, is Yahuwah, sealed on our foreheads. Our obedience is evidence of our belief. Our obedience is evidence of our belief. Gentiles engraft into the commonwealth of Israel through the covenant, and you can find that in Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 13. And so we guard two primary things. Remember the word Nazarim literally means watchmen, guardians and protectors. So what is it we're watching over? What is it we're guarding? And what is it we're protecting? There's two things, two main things anyway. Yahuwah's name. His name is precious. And Yahuwah's word. They're the two things we're guarding. The covenant. His covenant with Israel. So you've got the name and the word. Read Revelation 14, which describes the first fruits, and you will notice we do two things. We obey the commandments of Elohim and hold to the testimony of Yahusha. And we have been pursued by the dragon from the very beginning because of this reason. Our continual opponent is the dragon. And if this is all starting to sound a bit wahoo for you already, let me go briefly into what perception is. I want to talk to you about perception. Because perception is not reality. You might have seen something, heard something, or read something, and even spoken things. But is it all truth? Because our perceptions vary, what is real to each of us also varies. What I think is real and how I was brought up to believe and the standards I have, it might be very different to you. And that's a perception. But is it real? Our personal reality is an illusion based on our individual perception of things and how we are programmed by our environment and the propaganda around us. We can only trust in Yahushua to guide us into all truth. We don't want a, a certain perception of something. We want the truth in our life. We are bent and out of alignment, everybody. But we need to allow Yahusha to purify our hearts and not hold to two opinions. We don't want the world's mind and the world's ways and also Torah. We want one or the other. And we want Torah. I want Torah. Our perception of many things is wrong. Think objectively about some things you've been exposed to in the media recently. Greenhouse gases, for instance. Now, we perceive them to be a very serious problem, don't we? And yet the greatest of these is water vapour. The reason this planet is habitable at all is because of these greenhouse gases. So in reality, greenhouse gases are a good thing. In fact, they're vital. Another perception, another example of a perception, is being an organ donor. 
and that's affected by being bombarded by propaganda also. Did Yahuwah intend for us to hack body parts from each other and reattach them? Or are we living in some kind of horror film? But that's another issue we can discuss later on. The main point is our minds are affected by the way we're brought up and things that are pumped into us. You know, lies and lies and lies that might have been repeated often enough. They just feel like truth. And those two examples about greenhouse gases and organ donation are just an example of how we have a perception or an opinion in our minds about whether something is good or bad. And it may not be Torah. It may not be the truth intended by Yahuwah, our creator. And likewise, about what we are called. The first followers of Yahusha were the Nazarim. But we have been duped into believing they were Christians. But don't worry, because you're going to learn what the first Christian church fathers actually said about the real first followers of Yahusha. And once you discover what they called them and how they treated them, and how they felt about the real followers of Yahusha, it will change your life forever. And if you are proud to be called a Christian, you might just have an alteration in your perception of things. Let's talk briefly about truth. The odd thing about truth is that it passes through three stages. Because of the state of the world that we live in, and all the strongholds and pagan mindsets we are brought up in, if you tell somebody something that is a universal, a scriptural, a truth, straight out of Torah, the first step is they will ridicule you. Because it's ridiculous. It sounds absolutely ridiculous. Secondly, the truth is violently opposed. First it's ridiculous, then it is violently opposed. And third, it is accepted as being self evident. And that's a quote from Arthur Schofram, 1788-1760, that without guidance of Yahushua's spirit of truth, there is a resistance to truth. You need Yahushua's guidance and the spirit of truth. Without it, there is resistance to truth. Because our human nature, it's just, it, we just rebel. We're, we're just programmed to rebel. It's in our nature, in our character from birth. We're just rebellious animals without Torah, without Yahushua's spirit in us. And because we have Yahushua's spirit of truth within us, we are followers of Yahushua, the Nazareth. We are Nazarim, just like his emissaries that he chose. We are now last day Nazarim, followers of Yahushua. So according to scripture, that's what we are called. And what we are called has a meaning that describes not only who we are, but the mission or role we serve. When you learn to be called by that which Yahushua calls you, it will change you in a profound way. When you learn the motives of the men that gave you the false label, you will never accept being called by that term again. And I will go into more proof and more detail later, but that term is Christianos, Christian. If you are happy to be called that, let me explain to you briefly where that word comes from. And you'll never want to go near it again. And you certainly won't want to be called it or be known by it. There are three references to that Greek word Christianos or Christian in scripture. And that's where most people, pastors, evangelists, Christians, get the term from and centuries ago that's where it came from in Acts 26 1 Peter 4 and Acts 11 but before I go there let me ask you a question did the Talmudim or the followers of Yahushua call themselves by a Greek term we're talking about Hebrew people here why would they call themselves by a Greek term or was this Greek term put upon them as a term of derision as a term of scorn and based on syncretism. Should we defend our Hebrew roots or Greek roots? Now I know plenty of people who are studying at seminaries and they've got books and books and books and papers and books and papers and books on the Greek language. They're learning it. They're learning how to speak it, learning how to study it. But what about our Hebrew roots? There's only one pure tongue in the earth. The pure tongue that Yahuwah spoke to Adam, he spoke to all his prophets, 
and he spoke when he came down as Yahusha, and he spoke it also. And guess what it is? Hebrew. And the majority of Christianity is based on Greek, all the Greek translations. And have a look, do some research and see how riddled with paganism the Greek nation was, the Greek society. We're nearly running out of time, but Acts 26 verse 28 says, Then Agrippa said to Paul, You almost persuade me to become a Christian. And that's G5546. 1 Peter 4.16 says, Yet if any suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him esteem Elohim on this behalf. And lastly, Acts 11.26 says, And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And this is the main scripture we're going to look at, that the Christians base their existence and their title upon. The disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. However, it does not say they called themselves by this term, does it? Was this term Christianos or Christian a syncretic phenomenon? Imagine for a second that we were gathered together today and people came along and said, you guys are just ridiculous. And they walked away and they called us the sect of the ridiculous. And we liked it so much and believed their lies so much that centuries later, we've got the Church of the Ridiculous. Well, that's just like being called a Christian today because they called them that out of derision, out of scorn. And before you start getting your back up and getting angry at me, stay tuned for part three where I will prove to you that the word Christian in the original mindset of the people when it was spoken the word Christian means cretin and a cretin was a mentally retarded person a cretinoid or in today's slang you would call them an idiot and I'm not being cruel here that's what the word meant and that's still what it means the documentary deals a lot with uh, the fact that the word Christian or Christianos is not what people think it is. It doesn't lead us to believe in the Messiah or the Anointed One. That's not really what the label infers, is it? It actually means idiot. There's not really any uh, gentle way to break that, is there? Not uh, to my... I, yeah, it's really sad that people don't realize this, but this started a long, long time ago. The word Christianos that they found three times in the text Christianity, of course, isn't there at all, but Christianos is a term that's used to describe the believers in Yahusha. They don't call themselves that. It's a term of scorn. And if you look up the etymology or the word source for the word Cretan, it actually means a, a poor fellow or an idiot. And, and they thought that they were simple because of the, they were so kind. There, there was a spirit within them that made them seem gullible, you know. But that wasn't something we call ourselves. But there was a place in Acts 24, verse 5, where a sophist, a, a, a hired speaker, was hired by the, the high priest and the Yahudim that came to accuse Paul of being a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarene. And it's right there in front of you. If you just open up Acts chapter 24, verse 5, that's what we were called at that time. That's what we call ourselves. And that's what the Yahudim knew, knew us as. Even today, they call Christians not serene, you know. Not to, not to be confused with uh, the, the vow or the Nazir, you know, the Nazarite vow. That's a completely different word. You know, like Samson or Shimshan. Samson was a Nazir, but uh, you can't become a Nazir now. It's, the temple doesn't exist, except in, in the form of ourselves. You know, yeah. but there's a prescription that you have to a, a thing you have to go through. You know. Hmm. So when you're saying in Acts 24 that they they're called that's where they were first called Christians, uh, is that what the King James says? Is it? at uh, Antioch, yeah. right? And the taught ones were called Christianos first 
in Antioch. Now that phrase, and if you look at the actual Greek text, it, it's arranged in such a way that it, it, appear, it emerges really clearly that they weren't calling themselves that, but they were being referred to as the uh, Christianos at first mm. in, in Antioch. At first. Mm. And it doesn't mean that was the first time they were called something like that. That It's saying that at first, when they were in Antioch, they were called Christianos, which is a term of scorn. And it doesn't say anything in there where it's teaching us that that was, uh, I mean, we've been just mind washed with these thoughts. And there, that's one of the three places in all of the texts where the word Christianos is even used. Mm -hmm. You know, in fact, uh, Peter refers to a phrase, uh, Christian, and let's look up that word Christian mm -hmm. in, the, in Peter's writing. Yeah. And that would be, whoops. All right. In First Peter, it, he's talking about something that they were being accused of in a scornful way. It says, yet if, as a Christian, if you're, in other words, if you're suffering or being accused of being a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him, you know, it, it's just misunderstanding the phrase. It says, then Barnabas went to Tarsos to seek Shaul, or Paul. Now, but if one suffers being Christian, in other words, as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him esteem Elohim in this manner. Of course, that's, you know, that's a translation too. But uh, it, what it's really saying is completely different than what they didn't call themselves that. I mean, that's a term of scorn. If you're suffering from that, from being, taking on that, that name, if somebody calls you a fool or an idiot, then he's saying, let him not be ashamed. You know, the, the word Christianos in the ancient world was not the name of a sect. It's the way that we get the word Cretan. It's a, just a term of scorn. Mm. You know, so that's the real difference. And the adversary has been very skillful at being able to call the followers of Messiah by a term that's Greek. You know, why wouldn't you use a Korean term or a Chinese term or maybe a term from Poland? Why would he use a term of scorn used in the Greek world for naming the followers of Yahushua? Well, it's interesting. I don't know. And maybe that was one of the reasons why, you know, the, the, Romans, the Romans understood the, the meaning of the word better. And so they, you know, it's just amazing. Um, but, you know, it's right there. I mean, we can't be known by two different names, you know. No. We're either not serene or we're Christians. Now, the Christians went on to become a, a sect of great power. And, of course, Constantine developed a lot of that. But before that, there was a struggle in the, first, in the second century. The, the disciples of the apostles, like Polycrates and others, were at odds with certain elders that were in these cities, like Rome, and Polycrates wrote to Victor, in, in, who was the elder or bishop of Rome, uh, arguing about the timing of the Passover, you know. And of course, they were doing things differently, and they started to draw apart. And then the catechetical school at Alexandria, Egypt, became the first Christian training seminary. You know, and it still exists, actually. The original meaning for the word Christian is cretin, cretinoid, a mentally retarded person, or in today's slang, an idiot. And so there are millions and millions and millions of people jumping up and down all over the world, declaring, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, yes, hallelujah, I'm a Christian. And some of them do get so over the top and colourful, I do have to think, you certainly are, aren't you? Not judging, of course. But the modern mind gives no thought to what the original term actually meant in the ancient world. But rather, we all simply accept that the word Christian means a follower of Christ. There is absolutely no way under heaven or earth that the original Hebrew writings of Yahushua's followers contained a Greek term for what they referred to themselves as. Greek is not the language of the New Testament. 
Greek is not the language. Let me say it like Greek is not the language of the New Testament, as most modern theologians profess. The original memoir of Matthew is referred to by one of the early church fathers, and soon we will read what he said about this. Did you hear that? They actually have the original Paleo Hebrew copy of Matat Yahu, the book of Matthew, proving that it was written in Hebrew, not Greek. But first, let's notice the etymology of the term as it was used by those who spoke Latin. And the ancient idea behind the word Christianos, or in Latin, Christianus, seems to prove it was a term of scorn, a term of derision. It wasn't very nice. The Greek worshippers of Egyptian S-E-R-A-P-I-S were called Christianos. So we're going to bring in the pagan background and worship behind this word Christian. And we'll start with a quote from an early philosopher. And remember, it's a Christian, so it's replaced the name of our wonderful Messiah with the common term J-E-S-U-S, or J-Man, as I'll refer to him as. The early Alexandrian Christian community appears to have been rather syncretic in their worship of S-E-R-A-P-I-S, or S-Man, and J-Man, and would prostrate themselves without distinction between the two. They just mixed them together whenever they felt like it. A letter inserted in the Augustan history, ascribed to the Emperor Hadrian, refers to the worship of S-Man by residents of Egypt who described themselves as Christians, and Christian worship by those claiming to worship S-Man, suggesting a great confusion of the cults and practices. So we had people who worshipped J-Man, who called themselves worshippers of S-Man, and worshippers of S-Man, who called themselves worshippers of J-Man. Are you following this? Let's go on. The land of Egypt, the praises of which you have been recounting to me, my dear Servianus, I have found to be wholly light-minded, unstable, and blown about by every breath of rumour. There, those who worship S-Man are, in fact, Christians, and those who call themselves bishops of Christ are, in fact, devotees of S-Man. So we've got Christians who are worshipping S-Man, and we've got devoted followers of S-Man who are worshipping Christ, or J-Man. And so it's no big stretch to see that happening all over the world today, is it? Christendom today, right from the top, right from the head, right from the beast, right, filtering right through down, right, how many times are going to say right, right through into all the daughters of the beast. It's just riddled with paganism, isn't it? And because of the programming that everybody is brought up with and the lies told often and over and over and over again, we were all brought up believing we were followers of Christ. And yet we were following other pagan deities through worship of the festivals that they carry. We were not brought up in Torah, were we? We didn't have the opportunity, like we do now, to prove our belief by our obedience, by being faithful to our covenant. So do we want to think like a pagan? Do you want to think like a pagan and behave like a pagan? Or an Israelite, an Nazarim? We are the Nazarim, we are the guardians guardians of life, preserving the covenant. In Deuteronomy 4, verse 40, it says, And you shall guard his laws and his commands which I command you today, so that it is well with you and with your children after you, and so that you prolong your days on the soil which Yahuwah your Elohim is giving you for all time. He doesn't change. This is a commandment forever. So we do it. We guard two primary things. We guard his name and we guard his word. And we spoke about that a couple of chapters ago. We guard Yahuwah's word and we guard Yahuwah's name. And we wear special armor as guardians. We need both our weapons and our armor because we are Israel's special forces. We're the remnant. Nazarim are the special forces of Israel wearing the armor of light. And in Romans 13, it says, The night is far advanced. The day has come near. So let us put off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. The fruits of the Spirit of Yahushua are in us, the Nazarim. 
Because Matt at Yahoo 7 says, By their fruits you shall know them. And as we know in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, trustworthiness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. We are guardians of Torah, brothers and sisters. Protectors of Torah. We are Torah teachers. Little menorahs running around, shining our light to a darkened world. We do not refer to ourselves as Christianos. We do not refer to ourselves as the retarded people. We are bearers of light. We are the Nazarim, followers of Yahusha, HaMashiach. And we're constantly rediscovering and studying to find our Hebrew roots. Because remember, there is only one pure language in the world. And that is the Hebrew tongue. So if you're going to study a language for goodness sake, study Hebrew, the Paleo. Remember, we talked about the word Christian and how at Antioch, the believers of Yahushua were first called Christians, but they did not call themselves this term. I'm going to show you who first called them by this name, because it was a term of scorn. And we're going to discover who was responsible for such a wicked title on the true believers of Yahushua. A title which has lasted centuries and people all over the world are still proud to call themselves. And this leads us to the Catechetical School of Alexandria, <laughs> Egypt, and the church fathers who were trained and taught there. They developed what ultimately became Christianity and later Roman Universalism or Catholicism. What these early church fathers of Alexandria wrote about a certain sect, the Nazarim, may be of interest to those who want to trace back to the roots of their belief. Many of these early Christians were former sun worshippers that adopted a belief in the Mashiach, or the Messiah of Israel, Yahushua. They worked predominantly with Greek texts, yet from reading their Greek texts, we quickly discern that they despised the Nazarim, whose existence seemed to threaten their teachings. One of these early circus fathers indicated that these Nazarim possessed the writings of Matityahu, just like you said, and stated that they were in Hebrew letters, as they had been originally written. These facts and more to follow clearly contradict what many people today have been led to believe about the original followers of Yahushua. That's amazing, brother. Yes, and they were, uh, even today, and especially then, they were suppressing the Hebrew-Israelite roots of the faith, and of course the doctrines, and they keep all these other things. Modern seminaries today, or seed plots, promote the teachings of the church fathers, the Greek and Egyptian men that sought to eliminate the former Nazarim. The Nazarim were spoken against by those in authority even in the days of Shaul. And in Acts 28 we read, And we think it right to hear from you what you think. For indeed concerning this sect we know that it is spoken against everywhere. This sect, the Nazarim, was suppressed by the early church fathers and by the developing hierarchy at the earliest formal school of Christianity. And that was the Catechetical School of Alexandria, founded in 190 CE. The term by which the early followers of Yahushua of Nazareth were called is found at Acts 24 verse 5, but it's misspelt Nazarenes. The reason they were so despised by everyone is simple to understand, because this entire planet is under the influence of a supremely dark force that has been in charge over mankind for the last 6,000 years plus, since Adam and Chua lost sovereignty over the earth. And in Revelation 12 verse 17 we see, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to fight with the remnant of her seed. Those guarding the commands of Elohim and possessing the witness of Yahushua Messiah. Note the word guarding. That's who we are, guardians. That's what Nazarim means. Obeying the commandments and possessing the witness of Yahushua are not 
are not what the church fathers did, and they weren't going to stand for anyone else doing it either. The 4th century church father Jerome described the Nazarim as those who accept Messiah in such a way that they do not cease to observe the old law. This was, of course, in stark contrast with them. That old law that he just referred to, that old law is the Torah, the Ten Commandments, guarded by the Nazarim, guarded by us, Nazarim. The dragon, as we read in Revelation 12, pursues the offspring, and the offspring is us. He pursues the offspring of the woman, Israel, through systematic persecutions, because of doctrinal competition and control. The Hebrew roots, the origin of our belief, the Hebrew roots of the fig tree of Israel, remains a threat to this dragon's bad tree. But Yahushua has given his Nazarim, us, he's given us his Torah, and this is the axe, his sword and his word. And this will become the downfall of the great false system, the Roman beast. This will be its downfall. And it's ridden by the great prostitute, which has made the nations drunk from the golden cup of abominations, a golden cup filled with sacraments and false forms of worship. And she holds all of these and controls them. Even Yehusha's cousin, Yehukanon, or John the Baptist, said this, And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. But the thing of it is that the circus fathers is what we should call them, like Origen and Pantanus and Clement uh, and many others, Tertullian, uh, all through the centuries kept these other doctrines. And they refer to the Nazarene mm. in their writings, you know, and they were, in fact, Nazarene were even in existence in the 13th century, but uh, they were always considered to be heretics, mm. which is really odd. Let me, let me just read one of these. There was a, 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 a circus father in the 4th century whose name was Epiphanius, and he was a very brilliant man, but let's look what he wrote and he gave a detailed description of the Nazarene. We shall now especially consider heretics who call themselves Nazarene. They are mainly Yahudim and nothing else. They make use not only of the New Testament, but also use in a way the Old Testament of the Yahudim. For they do not forbid the books of the law, the prophets, and the writings. Wait a minute, let's stop right there. He says, for they do not forbid the books of the law, the prophets, and the rights, as if they did. Now, that's really odd. Now, let's continue. So that they are approved of by the Yahudim, from whom the Nazarene do not differ in anything. And they profess all the dogmas pertaining to the prescriptions of the law and the customs of the Yahudim, except they believe in the Messiah. They preach that there is one Elohim, and his son, Yehushim the Messiah, but they are very learned in the Hebrew language, for they, like the Yahudim, read the whole Torah, then the prophets. They differ from the Yahudim because they believe in the Messiah, and from the Christians in that they are to this day bound to the Yahudim rites, such as circumcision, the Sabbath, and other ceremonies. They have the good news according to Matthew, or Matthew in its entirety in Hebrew. For it is clear that they still preserve this in the Hebrew alphabet as it was originally written. And there he is. He's, he's saying many things here. See, Epiphanius is saying that they have a copy of Matthew, or Matthew as it was originally written in Hebrew. Whoa! And then also we have uh, they're, they're, he's fighting against the fact that we would be obeying the Torah and and actually reveal, and not forbidding it, hmm. not only having it but obeying it. You know, and they have things like the Sabbath and circumcision and other ceremonies. What's the problem with that? You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was I was raised as a Catholic, of course, and we uh, 
circumcise our male children, you know, not because of a, an ordinance, but because of health reasons. So I was circumcised, as was all my brothers. But here's the thing. Uh, these people back then didn't like it, but they had no problem with castration. In fact, many of these circus fathers were self-castrated. Uh, you know, what's that about? Oh, uh, man. <laughs> well. you know. Uh, they they were just really, and they were they thought we were heretics. You know, if we were running around castrating ourselves. Uh, I don't know. They, it's just all messed up. Yeah. It seems like I mean I can understand if they were writing if they said we were heretics because we were castrating ourselves, but we're not heretics because we're keeping the Sabbath. <laughs> you know, you're a heretic for walking as Yahushua walked. Well, sure, yeah. Yahushua didn't tell us to go around castrating ourselves. No. He said, you know, this, if you seek life, keep the commandments, you know. Yeah. But then he said, well, that was before the cross. Yeah. You know, I, I don't see where that's written anywhere. The teachings hatched at the catechetical school of Alexandria persist in every modern seminary today. Way back then, the teachings are still going on today in all the seminaries. The apostasy, the falling away from Torah, became institutionalized, and men's traditions were set up to conceal their former pagan origins. Yahuwah's clean festivals reflect the redemption plan for Israel, but they were forsaken, and you can read about that in Daniel 7 verse 25. All the nations of the earth are invited to engraft into the commonwealth of Israel through the covenant. As Ephesians 2 verse 8 to 13 says, However, the spin put upon obeying the covenant is very deceptive. They call it legalism. If we are legal, then we are true citizens of Israel. But if we are practicing lawlessness, which is illegalism, we are actually impostors, usurping what is not ours to claim. We cannot simultaneously claim to be Yahushua's followers and not obey his Torah. If we claim to know him, then we need to obey the commandments. And you've probably heard all those excuses, haven't you? Oh, that's legalism. You don't have to follow all the scripture. It doesn't really mean that. What are we going to do next? Start stoning people? Oh, that's too strict. That's too harsh. That's not what the Creator meant all these silly excuses so that they don't have to obey what the scripture says. The Catholic writings of Benacasus entitled Against the Heretics refers to Nazarenes who were also called Pazagini. Benacasus says, let those who are not yet acquainted with them please note how perverse their belief and doctrine are. First, they teach that we should obey the law of Moses according to the letter the Sabbath and circumcision and the legal precepts still being in force. Furthermore, to increase their error, they condemn and reject all the church fathers and the whole Roman church. You bet we do. We were still around in the 13th century, you know. Indeed, we Natrium still obey that old law. You bet we do. The covenant as it was written. And we still reject all the church fathers and the whole Roman church. Put it on your record. We are accused of being Jewish, but we are made up of all the lost tribes in captivity among the nations as the prodigal son found himself and returned to the covenant, the father's household, returning to Torah. In fact, we are those described at Revelation 12 and 14. 1. We hold to the testimony of Yahushua in that we confess Yahushua and live according to what he taught. And two, we obey the commandments of Yahuwah. And for this, we are branded as perverse heretics. We call on the true and only name, Yahuwah, each time we utter the Deliverer's name, Yahushua HaMashiach. We have never been part of the accepted whole and never will. Here's a logical conclusion though, guys. If the early church fathers considered the Nazarim to be heretics following another path or walk, that of Yahushua, can it be concluded that the Christian church today is the prophesied apostasy, the falling away from Torah? 
Worldwide, there are about one billion people living and producing bad fruit, according to the doctrinal errors, which is a bad tree, of a few men called the Circus Fathers. These men moulded the patterns of early Christianity and in their own words declare they were not Nazarene, but rather suppressed the Nazarene as heretics and accused them of perversion for obeying the commandments. These circus fathers were men who failed to adopt the covenant, but instead pursued control over doctrines as they interpreted them. Some castrated themselves, as you said, and others became monks, took vows of poverty, celibacy, silence, and condemned the Nazarim for holding to the Torah while professing belief in Yahushua. And a sophisticated religious architecture exists designed to promote a culture of rebellion. It's wicked. Yeah, it? it is. Uh, you know, and false doctrine is like leaven, and their false doctrines have filled the whole earth, mm. which is the lump of dough. You know, and that's referred to in uh, Zechariah chapter 5, you know, the, this uh, ephah measure that was put into this basket with a lead lid. And uh, that, that woman that was in there represented this this uh, mother of harlot, uh, the mother of harlots, and of course the uh, EASTER thing is, in, is is one of the doctrines, and we referred to that back at this last seminar. Hmm. But anyway, the the covenant is just abhorred by these people. They say it's over with. But read Yish, uh, Jeremiah or Jeremiah chapter thirty one. See, he's not going to ever get, get give up on his covenant. Although we have in our past, we were born in in a, as Gentiles, but we woke up at like the prodigal son and said, "Wait a minute, we're we're the descendants of the covenant, you know, the the promise, and we return to the covenant where he said we would." In Deuteronomy four, he said we, he would wake us up where we where where we were where he had scattered us, and we would return to him, not physically, he would gather us, but we would return to his covenant with all these words come upon us in the last days. And also in Deuteronomy 30, it refers to that too. I have a, a website, a web page actually, if you go to or, uh, the uh, How Are Messianics Different in my articles pages, I think it's in the fi like 54 or something like that. It's uh, how are Nazarene different from Christians? Not that we're hateful to Christians, because the Christians are waking up. They're the, you know, the, the ones that we love are, and we've been dedicating our lives to to, to, to rooting out and finding them and converting them. Because, you know, the followers of, of Yahushua were not instructed to go and convert to any other, or, you know, certainly to... In, and, and graft into any other thing, but uh, the, the Torah, you know. Anyway, let's see. Uh, without knowing it, Christians are followers of a Greco-Roman culture of names, terms, festivals, all adopted intact from pagan sources, yet adapted or mixed carefully with ideas and people from the Hebrew scriptures. And the mixing of Practices and beliefs is called syncretism. These heresies began through the teachings of Simon Magus and other circus fathers and eventually became the institution known today as Catholicism. And that would, of course, I think include Eastern and Western, you know. The great schism or schism produced the Eastern Orthodox Catholicism and later the Reformation in the 16th century further fragmented the movement. But much error remained from the adherence to the early Circus Fathers and their writings. And these Circus Fathers persecuted and despised the first followers of Yahushua, the Nazarene, and they wrote about us. They considered us heretics because we obey the Torah. So there it is. Hmm. Yeah. See, we keep things like the festivals. See, like here's what we do: the messianics, or I, I would, I would call us not supreme. That would be a more accurate, true term. We use the Hebrew name for the Creator, and we call upon it 
And we use the Messiah's true name, Yahushua. And the weekly Sabbath is observed as a day of rest. And the seven annual festivals that are commanded for Israel to observe are observed. And there's no observance of a single Christian festival, which are all derived from pagan festivals. Mm -hmm. And the Christians, the Christians on the other hand, the name of the Creator is avoided. But they put in L-O-R-D, which is a tr direct translation from the Hebrew word B-A-A-L. Then they take other generic terms and refer to him, like G-O-D and, you know. Uh, J-E-S-U-S. -S. Yeah, they use J-E-S-U-S, which is corrupted beyond all recognition of his true name. But anyway, the weekly Sabbath is not observed as a day of rest, but it's thought of as to being having been moved to Sunday, the pagans' former day of worship, the day of the sun. The seven annual festivals, which were commanded to Israel to observe, which are actually shadows of his redemption, Yahushua's redemption of Israel, they're ignored and replaced with seven sacraments, which are not known of in Scripture anywhere. And that violates the command to not add or take away. Isn't that odd? Yeah. So there, and Christians are, are obeying so, uh, these sacraments, or not all of them, but most of them have some sacraments. They they understand the word. They keep Sunday. They also keep uh, this Ash Day, where they put this cross on their foreheads. They, a, a lot of them, and they observe this thing called Lent. Find that in Scripture. Well, you will, but it's the fast for the weeping for Tammuz. And then you have this festival they call E-A-S-T-E-R, which we just did a seminar, yeah. you know. Oh, boy. And then they keep Pentecost, which is good, but they use it. It's a Greek word that it, it, it refers to the Hebrew festival of Shabuot, but they call it Pentecost, which means count 50, counting 50 days from the first fruits to the resurrection day to the um, uh, actually, it's a, after uh, seven weeks, seven complete weeks, and the day after the seventh Sabbath is a, is a day that we commemorate the giving of the Torah, which is recorded in Acts chapter 2, and they're actually right about that. But that's not a Christian thing. That's Israel assembled in Jerusalem to uh, remember the, the giving of the Torah at Sinai, you know, which they don't want. They don't want the Torah that was given at Sinai. Yeah. But anyway, then they have this thing called All Saints Day. And that, uh, of course, is related to the Halloween thing. Because the All Hallowed's even refers to All Hallowed's, All Saints Day. And then they have this thing called Christmas. And they have this thing called Epiphany. And, of course, Christmas is pagan. And then they mm -hmm. use the Roman calendar, which completely, you know, messes everything up. But... Anyway, the, the Nazarene observe the festivals, which includes the Sabbath day every seventh day, and then the seven annual Sabbaths, and then they keep Passover, you know, and matzah, unleavened bread, Shavuot, which is the giving of the Torah at Sinai. They also keep Yom, Yom Teruah, the day of the shout, in the seventh month on the first day of the month. And Sukkoth, which is, you know, a, a, a shadow of the, the wedding feast. You know, that we're hoping as first fruits to become um, part of and to draw others in. We're not trying to make it into the first fruits ourselves. We're trying to help other people get there because we are the first fruits. That's evidence that we are. And it's not something we're going, oh boy, we're okay. We're, we're worried about everybody else, you know. But uh, anyway, we, we follow the Hebrew calendar. So the ultimate determination that you have to assume is that. One is a, pra a, a list of operations or practices that is not of Yahuwah, that's of men's traditions, and it's all derived from the dragon's agenda, Babylon. And that the, the, the Messiah of Israel observed all the practices that we observe. So why would he stop observing them and have his followers stop observing them? See, we're not uh, doing it because we are mad at anybody. We want people to understand what is going on and how they got confused because in Revelation, the dragon is, the, is, is accused of deceiving the whole world. Now, if deceiving the whole world would be 
teaching Torah and keeping the Sabbath and using the correct name, is that deceiving the whole world? Or on the other hand, are the Nazarene trying to overcome the work of the dragon and the act and the well the practices that people have inherited that are deceptions. That's what we're really trying to do. It's not that we're mad or we're better. It's just that we're trying to, hey, hello, wake up. You know, something's wrong. Something doesn't smell right here. You know, <laughs> and, and of course, because of that, we're being persecuted. And that's another sign that, you know, we're not persecuting them. We're not locking them up and torturing them and saying, you've got to repent of this bunny rabbit and this tree. We're not hurting them. We're not we're not persecuting them and, and dragging their names through the mud. You know, we're we're the ones that are having our names drug through the mud, you know, because we're working with them. You know, I mean some of us are. <laughs> anyway, and then I I just uh, like this week I, the, the the attacks are becoming more frontal, you know, they're getting more serious, but, you know, and that's fine. Yeah. But anyway, I'm, I know why I'm not afraid. I would just want to mention this because this is very important. Do you remember the, t the 12 spies? Well, the two spies that were, and they had a good report, and then the other 10 that didn't. Well, the difference between those 10 and the other two was we know that Yahuwah is with us. And that's why we're not afraid. Hmm. They can do what they will, you know. Oh, no weapon formed against us, you know, can prevent. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. You know, the witches and the atheists are all practicing the Bunny Rabbit Festival, and they do Christmas, too. And there's not any real reason why they would not do that, because they consider it a secular thing. Halloween is secular to them. We know it's not. But... Uh, that, that's true. They all feel good, but you see, that's just it. There's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it's a way of, it's a way of death because they don't know it. They don't recognize it. They don't see what they're doing, and it's an offense to Yahuwah because they don't worship Yahuwah. They worship the Lord, and that's B-A-A-L. Mm -hmm. See, the identity thief has taken over, and in their minds, the footnotes of their translations and their pastors are all just putting band-aids on and making them feel warm and fuzzy and comfortable when in fact they are in serious trouble and they're and they're just listening to this wine that's in the cup of this harlot this mother of harlots is holding this cup of doctrines pouring forth you know these uh, teachings this leaven you know and uh, but, you know, you were absolutely right. Uh, they are feeling fine, you know. It's because they're not interested in what the Creator actually thinks is good and bad. Yeah. You have to prove what is pleasing to Him mm -hmm. from His Word and nowhere else. You can't go to a, an organization. See, that's where the Nicolaitans really succeeded because they kept everybody in the dark for so many centuries. And then in the last days, I think it's Daniel 12, it says knowledge will increase. Oh, I probably I shouldn't mention the chapters. I always get the wrong chapters. But anyway, knowledge will increase. And uh, I'd like to find that in the scriptures here and read that because it's it's all about us being not only being able to have more knowledge, and it's not to look up on the internet and find out what the sound of a woodpecker is that he's referring to. He's talking about knowledge true knowledge that we're supposed to have because people are perishing because they don't have knowledge. Uh, let's find Dan. Where is he? Here he is. Now let's look at chapter 12. Let's see. Oh yeah. It's in, in chapter 12, it's a very important part here. It says uh, uh, in, in the uh, first part of the chapter, it says that, uh, and at that time your people shall be delivered everyone who is found written in the book, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth wake up, some to everlasting life and some to reproaches and everlasting abhorrence. And I think we're referring to there the second resurrection at the end of the great white throne. And those who have insight shall shine like the brightness of the expanse, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So the ones that are leading those 
people out of the darkness uh, are going to shine. But uh, mm -hmm. I think it's chapter 10 that I really wanted. Let's see. There was a thing on the telly last night about uh, someone speaking from the Sydney Institute. Uh, his name was Lord such and such. I forget his name. And he was a really? scholar of some sort. And he was doing a must. It was an annual speech they do. And he was, because I thought I must have tuned into some Catholic thing, but it wasn't. And he was doing a whole rundown of Tyndale and uh, how the King James came about and what, what a big revolution it caused because people suddenly had the truth in their laps and they didn't have to, you know, be relying on the institution to teach them. Uh, and he was, just, he was just saying how much uh, literature and poetry and Shakespeare and Dunn and all these authors and poets were just riddled then after that with scriptural terms and euphemisms and concepts that were in the scripture. You can track all the all the um, concepts of scripture and their quotations and uh, maxims and phrases and things that they use that come from the scripture because ever since Tyndale did his work and nobody recognized Tyndale for it, they all burned him at the stake, but um, the, when the King James came out, it, it just caused such a big blast on the face of the earth as far as true knowledge was concerned because everybody had could get their own scriptures and uh, it was just a, a blowout because we you know when you come in and being a natural you think oh you get rid of your king james but you don't realize apart from the pagan terms that it was it was quite a, a mir miraculous thing to happen on the earth as far as pushing knowledge uh in the you know pushing forward in knowledge, having the King James jump onto the earth. Everyone could read their own scriptures themselves. Yeah. Mm. I wasn't um, ever angry at the fact that the King James Version had some errors in it. It, it was obviously uh, flawed, but it has done an amazing thing. In fact, uh, it was, of course, based upon the Geneva, as I understand it. The, but the King uh, didn't like the, uh, you know, the the... Per, well, he considered himself Catholic still, and he was very upset about the Geneva because it was really, to him, a Protestant-type translation, and it was also very uh, knowledgeable. But uh, anyway, I found the text I was looking for, the knowledge showing it's Daniel 12, verse 4, but you, Daniel, hide the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall diligently search, and knowledge shall increase. You know, but, um, and this knowledge, of course, is going to increase because you, who is willing it to happen. I think you're right. The King James is, you know, the one of the works that that was supposed to begin this knowledge. And of course, if that had never existed, then even literacy would have suffered because that has influenced the English language, at least, all over the earth. And English it seems to be. Maybe the prophetic thing that Yahuwah said when he said, I will speak to you in babbling lips, which we're doing. And English is the language of business around the entire earth. And the British Empire is the reason that, you know, in fact, there was a, a time when the sun never set on the British Empire because there were so many colonies. And the, the age of colonization was a, was an answer to many prof prophecies itself, the scattering of his people, not the, the British people themselves, necessarily the only ones, but they're speaking to the people, at the words, and they're speaking at his words. There's not a famine of his word anymore in the sense that we're restoring his name and his commandments or Torah, you know, because if, there, if there's a famine of his word, he's really not just talking about the fact that People can't get a copy of the scriptures. That is included in that, of course. But a famine of knowing his will, his, his, his uh, covenant has been kept from people. They've had it right in front of them, the ones that could get it, but even they were deceived and the word was kept from their knowledge because they were taught by these circus fathers and their writings that we can't go near that. And as I mentioned before, there were two pastors in the last couple of weeks that I heard on the radio, and they both said the very same thing. And they were from different places. Uh, they, One of them, well, they both said 
that the reason that the commandments were given at Sinai was to prove to us that we couldn't obey them. Hmm. <laughs> oh boy, and that that's just wrong. You know, the commandments were given because they're a precious gift, and they're written on our hearts now, at least the Nazarene, and we're sharing them. And they're there as a gift of love because they teach us how to love Yahuwah and how to love our neighbor. They were, that's, that's what they say that they were given for. Not to show us we couldn't obey them. You know. Yeah, that's what we were taught. We were taught all that. You, you, you could never obey them. That's why Yahushua had to come. So then we wouldn't have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they basically annihilated the commandments. They annihilated his name, and they annihilated his word. And we're here, being raised up by the Spirit of Messiah, Yahushua, to, as Nazarene, just as we were in the first days as his first followers. Mm -hmm. And so we have been given a spirit, that his spirit, that loves the commandments, and you know you do. You know, when, when you're in the presence of a not sorry, a person who loves the commandments, and he says to you, or she says to you, I love the commandments. Wouldn't you like to as well? You know, then that would make a Christian say, well, I've been taught to not want them, but I want them. You know, every heart yearns for them, and they need them desperately. You know, Messiah always pointed to them. You know, that's what a, a rabbi does. His function is to teach the commandments, you know. And he's called rabbi or teacher, and what would he have to teach us? To, to just do whatever our heart wants to do? Or if, <laughs> No. He wants us to learn his word and study it, meditate in it day and night, just like Psalm 1 says. And the one that does that is like a tree planted by streams of water. And everything he does prospers. But not so for the, you know, the ones that don't. You know, they're like chaff. So, you know, you have to decide. Read Psalm 1 and then read Psalm 20, uh, 119. You know, mm -hmm. when I read Psalm 119 for the first time, I wanted to meet that guy that wrote that and hug him, you know. <laughs> so, man, you feel just the way I do, you know, about the Torah. You know, it's amazing. Amazing. Yeah. The 1945 Encyclopedia Americana has this to say under the topic G-O-D. G-O-D, a common Teutonic word for personal object of religious worship, formally applicable to superhuman beings of heathen myth. On conversion of Teutonic races to Christianity, the term was applied to supreme being. What about that? Nazarim do not refer to Yahuwah by any pagan titles or names. They use his true name, being careful to guard it and not allow it to be destroyed, and not using it as most of the world doesn't. That destroys it. Torah means instruction, and Torah is a relationship, not a religion. This relationship is the code of conduct for the government or kingdom of Yahuwah, to reign with his bride, Israel. Human religion seeks to rebind the rift between our Creator and mankind with the contrived efforts and rituals invented by men, often inherited from pagan cultures, not ordained by Yahuwah. Torah is the foundation for the relationship, and the Creator consistently refers to Torah as a marriage covenant between himself and Israel. Our commission as Nazarim is to teach Torah to the nations, thus increasing Israel. The dragon hates this idea, the covenant and the Nazarim. The covenant is between Yahuwah and his bride, Israel, and it is a marriage. The dragon was never fond of Israel, and this sentiment was present in the church fathers and those doctrinal descendants of them, i.e. the church today. When false teachers say, Gentiles don't have to obey, the Torah is just for Jews. They have been influenced by false teachings, keeping them imprisoned in a stronghold. And a stronghold is a mental fortress of false belief 
stemming from replacement theology, replacement theology, a foundational error of Christianity. A sophisticated religious architecture exists. Mm, sophisticated religious architecture exists designed to promote a culture of rebellion. Unknowingly, the human combatant's energies have been harnessed to perform the will of their enemy. And this is a classic Sun Tzu maneuver in his art of war. And it's implemented by Jesuitism. So it's, I think it's important for people to understand that, um, particularly in this world we live in where there's Facebook and YouTube and all these, you know, online forums and things you're talking about, you, you, you can put, put out, put out, put out, put out this word and this message and YouTube clips and everything out there. And you think to yourself, how is that not obvious? It, sometimes even you grab hold of a picture that someone sends through and you think, oh, that's so, that's so clear, that's obvious. And yet nobody, nobody grasps it. You think, how can they not see this? How can they not see when, like, there's been a, a lot of good pictures about EASTER going through Facebook the last week or so, and you think, oh, what do the Christians think when they look at that? Half of them, half of them, it doesn't even touch the sides, you know, and you think, how is that? It's important to see that people are really asleep, and there's nothing you can really do about it, is there? Uh, except pray that, I mean, if Yahushua doesn't wake them up. <laughs> that rings a bell. Anyway, uh, what I was thinking was, uh, as you said that, Facebook, some big thing hit the news, national news here, that uh, there was a fellow in the military who had just made a statement on his Facebook that if the president ever ordered him to do something that was against what he believed in his heart, that he wouldn't obey the command. Well, that made national news, and they're going to throw him out of the armed services, but yet the Facebook and the internet is loaded with the exposure of EASTER. And I wrote this in Fossilized Customs that one day, when this comes to light, that EASTER is really what it is, that this would turn the world upside down. And it hasn't happened yet, but it probably will. Because, you know, the scriptures don't talk so much about the virgin birth or, or Christmas, as even though it's the huge... Uh, celebration that they, they have. E-A-S-T-E-R, which they un understand, refers to the resurrection. The resurrection is talked about everywhere uh, in all the letters and books and everything. Not E-A-S-T-E-R, though. It's just what these Christian preachers do. They all talk about it, but they, they've been trying to pump up this word E-A-S-T-E-R. But in the end, people are going to go, whoa, I'm turning on you because, you know, you've been teaching this stuff from, to me for years about this E-A-S-T-E-R. Some of them have woke up and they said, well, we're not using that term. We're going to call it Resurrection Sunday. And in fact, they're actually accurate about that because the resurrection did occur on the first day of the week. But really, I, I want to back up and say it was probably at the sunset on the Sabbath before. The discovery of the empty tomb was the first day of the week. And that's mm -hmm. always, um, you know, first fruits. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the morrow after the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Not the morrow after the 15th, but mm -hmm. it is in this case, it is. This is one of those rare exceptions when the 16th of a bee is first fruits. See, first fruits is referring to the wave sheath of the first fruits of barley, and it's the pointing or a shadow of the resurrection, you know, which is what you're celebrating today or mm -hmm. observing. But none of that is an excuse to abolish the seventh day and do everything on the first day, is it? <laughs> Not a, no, that's what the, the uh, dragon was successful at, is abolishing the true weekly Sabbath by saying that, well, the resurrection occurred on the first day of the week. And it really didn't technically. He was... He finished the rest on the seventh day of the week, and Yahushua rose at that point when the seventh day was ending and the first day was beginning. And so he was going back to work, you know. Uh, but the three days and three nights was the sign of Yonah. Now, that isn't possible this year because 
you know, the, the, the uh, 14th was when the lamb was slain, and the 15th happened to happen to coincide with the weekly Sabbath, and the first day of the week is first fruits during the seven days of matzah. So uh, this year, the sign of Yonah would be impossible this year, yeah. you know. Yeah. But anyway, things like, um, you know, they justify things like monks and nuns and popes and sacraments, holy water, halos. Okay, let's go down the list. Where do you find these things in Scripture? Well, you do find pillars, sacred pillars, but they're not of Yahuwah. The Heat wants us to tear down those. Anyway, bells, steeples, catechisms, altars. Well, all, there is an altar. It's an unclean place, though, and it's outdoors. It's not inside. Spires, pulpits, cathedrals, statues. Statues. That's a violation of the second commandment. Sunday. Where do you find Sunday in the scriptures? E-A-S-T-E-R, -E Christmas, canonizing saints, indulgences, scapulars, masses. And no one noticed that these were added ideas. You know, But you're right, though, the Facebook thing. Why haven't people just seen this everywhere? I mean, it, but it, some little incident happens, and then suddenly it's national news, and it's just someplace on somebody's Facebook page. You know, yeah. Yeah. that's because the dragon's in charge of the world, mm -hmm. and it's not sensational to find out that E A S T E R is actually one of the names of the original names of the uh, Earth Mother. You know that the Babylonians actually worshipped. But, but not so we are here to tell you know. Let's read our Great Commission. In Manityahu 28, 18 to 20, it says, And Yahushua came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make taught ones of all the nations, immersing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the set-apart Spirit, teaching them to guard all that I have commanded you. And see, I am with you always, until the end of the age. And it says, teach them to guard all that I have commanded you. His Nazarim, those following him, the mediator of the covenant. Any who obey Torah become citizens of Israel, Yahuwah's covenant people. And if you join that group, or that sect, you will be despised, and you'll feel it. You will be called the most horrendous names you could possibly hear. So get used to that. In Revelation 18 verse 24, And in her was found the blood of the prophets, and set apart ones, and of all who were slain on the earth. The dragon's bride is the mother of all harlots. And here we have him seated there, the Roman pontiff, enthroned as an object of worship. And in Revelation 18 verse 7 it says, check this out, As much as she esteemed herself and lived riotously, so much torture and grief give to her, because in her heart she says, I sit as queen, and I am not a widow, and I do not see mourning at all. Roman Catholicism is modern M-O-L-O-C-H, worship, and it has daughters. And if you want to find them, filter through history and look into all the branches of Protestantism. And Revelation 18.3 says that the sovereigns of the earth have committed whoring with her. And what institution are we to come out from if not this mother spawned by the church fathers? The covenant is a marriage between Yahuwah and Israel, his bride, and Nazarim Israel, or Nazarene Israel, represents the first fruits of a great harvest. Israel is the only denomination, and the Nazarim are an elect group within Israel, and they are called by Yahushua as workers in his harvest of mankind. The name of the Creator and the symbol of his Torah are on the banner that you can see here. A prophesied reality is taking place in the earth. Yahushua removed his menorah or lampstand from the first assembly at Ephesus in Revelation 2 verse 5. It has been restored 
to Nazarim Israel today. The menorah is a symbol of the Torah, and it also is the most widely known symbol for Israel, because the Torah and Israel are inseparable. There is only one denomination, there is only one group of people that Yahuwah ever made a covenant with, and that is Israel. And within Israel is the Nazarim. I was wondering, brother, could we go through... Uh, I've had to cut a lot of the last part of the Nazarim just because it had lots of movies in it, where you were talking about the catechetical method of teaching. You've got that underneath your... um, towards the end of your Nazarim article. Oh, yes, that is an interesting thing. The uh, catechetical... Method. Yeah, you're talking now, about Mr. Goebbels yeah. and all that sort of thing. Yeah, catechesis is the method, and it's essentially teaching by means of an oral repetition process. And I, as a Catholic boy, I was very much in, involved in that. Teaching is accomplished through oral instructions, which are echoed by the students. So imprinting of the doctrines takes place and takes hold very quickly. And the instructor calls orally and the group echoes the required response, resulting in a very strong programming or imprinting of the thoughts of the whole group. And this is reflected in the drills used in military services as well, as responsatory chant and worship liturgies continue, and they continue to reflect this method of instructing large groups. Thus, the communion, that's the congregation or group, is programmed all together by this process, and it forms an emotional bond of cohesion and unity. All believe the same things, they behave the same way, and outsiders are quickly identified because of their lack of programming. And this leads to xenophobia, which is actually xenophobia means fear of foreigners. Class envy and anti-Semitism and their logical outcomes from such programming. This is a teaching method. Mm -hmm. And Goebbels, you mentioned the Nazi, uh, he was a Nazi propaganda minister. His name was Joseph Goebbels, and he was a Jesuit operative. He would, in fact, the Nazis, for, uh, they formed and patterned their whole operation after the organization of the Jesuits. He was the chief architect of the Kristallnacht attack on the German Yahudim. Uh, Kristallnacht is uh, kind of thought of as uh, the night of glass. And it was the night that all the Jewish or Yahudim shops were destroyed and notices went up and there was no business given to, that, to those stores. And anyway, historians consider this night, this attack, to be the commen co commencement of the Nazi violence that culminated in the Holocaust. In fact, we have Yom HaShoah coming up this month, uh, this fourth Roman month on the 19th day, which is not far off, is uh, Yom HaShoah. That's the day of the destruction, the day of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Anyway, all this catechesis or catechetical teaching, this oral repetitive chanting back and forth, uh, is a way to program the masses. Now, look at what Goebbels wrote. He said, if you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will, will eventually come to believe it. The lie can be maintained only for such time as the state can shield the people from the political, economic, and or military consequences of the lie. It thus becomes vitally important for the state to use all of its powers to repress dissent, for the truth is the moral enemy of the lie, and thus, by, exten by extension, the truth is the greatest enemy of the state. So, in other words, that's probably the answer to our question there that you raised. Why can't EASTER and other things be exposed for what they really are? Because this is the lie that is so big that they're, if, if they keep repeating it, often enough it will eventually become accepted by the masses, and it has. And they have to keep this suppressed. 
because the truth is the greatest enemy of the state. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. And he also said this, the most brilliant propagandist technique will yield no success unless one fundamental principle is born in mind constantly. It must confine itself to a few points and repeat them over and over. Mm -hmm. And he said, intellectual activity is a danger to the building of character. <laughs> Amazing. So how could these people be so, they were, they were really brilliant men, but their, their objective was to program the masses. Mm -hmm. And then he openly acknowledged that he was exploiting the lowest instincts of the German people. Racism, xenophobia, class envy, and insecurity. He could, he said, play the popular like a piano, leading the masses wherever he wanted them to go. He drove his listeners into ecstasy making them stand up, sing songs, raise their arms, repeat oaths. And he did it not through the passionate inspiration of the moment, but as the result of sober psychological calculation. Mm. That's amazing. Sounds like a Pentecostal service. <laughs> well, catechesis is a process of teaching mm. and program. And it's defined, it has defined psychological goals. Mm. You know. And he played them like a piano. Of course, that's what the Jesuits did. They, they do it. When you send your children to a Catholic school, they are programmed with catechesis, you know. And it didn't take with me. I mean, I was, I, it, it, I saw what was happening to my mind, and I was just saying, well, that doesn't make any sense. And I was always very questionable. I didn't, I, sometimes I'd ask questions, and I saw the, the hate from the fact that I'd asked such a question. You know, and it made me ask fewer and fewer questions. But that fed my resolve to find out what was really going on. And that's really what made me write the book, Fossilized Customs, because it turned me into a particular kind of person. I was hardened against their doctrines even while I was being programmed. It, it, and that's probably why it didn't work. But it's, uh, you know, we just pointed out, you know, as a... Form and when you see catechesis being used on you, you should know that it's being used on you. Mm -hmm. And we should use catechesis, I guess, in the right way because it can be a good tool. Because you see, if it's the truth that's being taught to you instead of the lie that Goebbels was referring to, then you'll remember it better. Because we're told in Deuteronomy chapter 6 to repeat this over and over and over. Whenever we come in, we go out, we lie down, we sit in our home. We're supposed to be programming our children. And that programming is you who is Torah. So why not? If only we had been taught that. You know, that way we would be pleasing and Yahuwah wouldn't have to do what he has planned for the earth. You know, the destruction can be thwarted if every single person on this earth raised their hands and said, we're, we're through with these lies. We want this Torah. Please come back. He'd come back gently and say, well, all right then. This is much better. Thank you for, you know, he'll pour his spirit out on you to make you, uh, uh, enable you to do it. Hmm. All you have to do is just turn to him, you know. He'll relent. You know. He says right there in Deuteronomy 6, Hear, O Yisrael, Yahuwah our Elohim, Yahuwah is one. And you shall love Yahuwah your Elohim with all your heart, with all your being, with all your might. And these words, which I am commanding you today, shall be in your heart. And you shall impress them upon your children, and shall speak of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up, and shall bind them as a, hand, as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. In other words, that kind of catechesis is fact. You know, keep repeating them over and over. But Goebbels was saying, you know, repeating a lie often enough will cause people to eventually believe it. But if you keep repeating the Torah to your children and to your grandchildren, day and night, you know, and they're gonna, they're gonna be raised as, as loving people, you know, because it teaches them love. 
But the stuff that we are taught or have been taught through Christian circles is keep away from those things. You know, you're not going to learn how to love if you stay away from the Torah. Mm -hmm. you know. oh, yeah. <laughs> it's all about trying to control everything if you're not in the love, isn't it? Well, yeah, the dragon does control everything. And um, mm -hmm. he's caused this because the dragon hates Israel. He hates the, the Torah. He hates marriage. You know, and the marriage, the covenant is actually a marriage. The Ten Words, or the Ten Commandments, that's the, the marriage vows. It's the thing that we're commanded to, to accept and to live by. And if we do that, that he will be our husband and we will be his bride. And Christians talk about the bride, the bride, the bride, but they don't have the covenant. Then they're in serious, deep trouble. And we're here to say, wake up, you know. You've been programmed by error, you know, and you need to need to reawaken and study on your own. You know, they, they tell people that they want them to study the Word, but then when they go to them and they say, well, look, this is written here. Why are we not doing this? Oh, that's Old Testament. What? <laughs> you know, that's just so wrong. Hmm. Well, that's amazing, well, brother. I've got to... I've got enough for what I need to do now. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, Wonderful. Well, yeah. I finally, uh, I haven't been looking at you. I've been looking at other things. But Yeah. Yeah. There, there you're back. Okay. <laughs> well, it looks like you uh, got your summer haircut going on. Yeah, yeah. It's been a bit hot lately. Mm. Yeah. 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 Well, that's, that's great. <laughs> What's, uh, what's behind this? I didn't know if there was anything behind Well, I think we're going to continue with the, the psychedelic swirling of the electric sheep sort of thing, like we did in the Nazarene documentary. So we're in this cosmic place this week. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, well, mm. I guess we'll see you. Uh, when, when are we going to do this now? I forgot. Uh, I think we're, we're on every second week of every month. Yeah. So we're just going to do it once a month. Well, that well, I was happy to do it. I'm happy to do it as often as you can. But you're pretty busy, aren't you? Yes, I am. I really am. And uh, the uh, I, I call the store that I work in my yo-yo. You know how yo-yo goes down, it comes back up, and goes down, and it, that keeps happening. But I, I I praise you here that I can be there to help people because almost every day there's somebody that comes in and I don't know, you know, who I'm going to share with, but. Uh, the, uh, the studying and the seminars and all that, you know, that takes a lot of time, too. And uh, But you have other things going on. You're sharing with uh, Colin yeah. And, uh, yeah. and Chris. And there's people are adding themselves to the, to the branches. That's wonderful, isn't it? Yeah, we need that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we need to see more people, uh, you know, that have something to bring to the teachings because Yahushua mm -hmm. is operating in different people in so many different ways. And we're, uh, do, you do what you do, and I do something completely different, but other people have other things to bring, you know, from their experiences and mm -hmm. the gifts that they were given, you know, the, 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 where they can operate in the body, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I really think that this is a, developing into a wonderful thing, that the mm -hmm. Institute is becoming a, a real institution, you know, of people, you know, and uh, I was going to say after the email yesterday you sent through about just more persecution and rubbish, why don't you, um, most people are online, but even those who are not online anymore, they're, um, they can send you a letter if they want to send you a letter, why don't you cut back on the phones or something or do something different with the phones because that's not really... It's not fair for Phyllis to have to sit there and cop all this crap every day, you know. Can't people order online like they normally do? And It's really, it's different if you run into people and they're having a go at you for something, but to have this coming into your home all the time, isn't there some, isn't there some other way you could sort of cut that back a bit and say, look, we're not taking phone orders anymore or something? I don't know what it would be, but I don't want to tell you what to do, but it just seems horrible that this is coming at you every single day and it should be... Emails is okay, you can go to them when you want, but when someone's in your ear, 
in your home. It's, that's horrible. Well, there there are poor people that are that are, that have been damaged by slander, gossip, and that sort of thing, and mm -hmm. they don't know mm -hmm. why things are happening the way they are. They have no idea. I didn't at first either. I wanted to run away too. But the thing that uh, Yahuwah has done is he's turned this thing into a wonderful thing, mm -hmm. an opportunity to reach people. But well, of course, when when of course I, either I I die or. Uh, somehow the, the, the thing is taken from me by some means that all the debts are paid off, then I'll give this my full attention. And I, it's always on my heart anyway. I, wherever I am, I'm, I'm doing His will because I'm not sitting on the throne of my heart. And that's where the real danger is. In fact, this last accusation was pretty hard on Phyllis because they were saying that I had stolen all of this stuff and turned it into books and other people's work, and yet on their websites, I see the things that I personally designed in the background, like uh, my the flag that the Nazarene fly with the menorah, the and the two, you know, <laughs> and I'm going well. I'm not going to mention any of that. You know, let them use that. Let them use anything that I've written. That's fine. If they steal my work, that's fine. It's not really my work because it was given to me, not by others, but through the you know, like Yahushua was praying, it, that he prayed for those who would believe in me through their word. You know, and we're not serene too. And we're transmitting what was given to us from for, former people, you know, the apostles and, and, uh, and other saints. But certainly, I'm not stealing people's work, you know. <laughs> and then repackaging it for money. You know, yeah. if that's true, why am, why am I not making money? You know? I mean, I do receive donations, and the donations are absolutely vital for me to pay that huge mortgage. Mm. You know, mm. utility bills and, and supporting people that live in the building that take care of things that in the operation. You know, mm. wish I could house more people uh, there to, to do more work. Mm. But uh, mm. we're, we are limited, you know. Mm. We can only do so much. You'll have to pull out a version of that bold mud for me. I still haven't seen that yet. <laughs> oh, you know, yeah. David uh, has a copy. You know, Come uh, on, well, David. Come on. Cough it up. <laughs> Can't hold on to this little Jim. Yeah, we'll get we'll get a hold of that thing from him. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll have to write a note to myself and, and get a hold of that. I'm going to do that. Mm -hmm. Bold mud. I'm going to try to do that this week yeah. and uh, <laughs> see what I can do. Yeah. Maybe make some copies and... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Send you some of them, you know. Yeah. Yeah. See, you, you can see the first genesis of, of when I started to wake up at, yeah. at that yeah. point. And that was uh, like around 1985, 86, you know, and the first things. And I hand wrote the thing, you know, because I didn't have, I knew how to type, but I didn't have a, a word processor or a typewriter. And, of course, the Internet really didn't exist, you know, mm. at that point. Mm. But, of mm. course, uh all this stuff in the fascicles and fossilized customs, they claim I stole from the internet, you know. <laughs> and yet, stuff was in existence long before the internet, yeah. you know. Yeah. I had done all this research in libraries. Well, I better let you go. Yes, sir. And, yes. You know, well, well, I'm, I'm going to... Sorry, yet. Yeah. It was wonderful seeing you. Yeah, you too. Always wonderful. I'm going to mash this, this Torah talk together with the, the documentary and see what comes out. Okay. And then we'll keep your <laughs> seminar a separate thing. Okay. So, wonderful. Wonderful to hear all the fresh stuff again, brother. It's wonderful. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, there's a lot more probably that we could have put in, but we'll put in the main things. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You have a lovely rest of your Sabbath day. Eh? You too. Yeah. We love you. Love you too. All right. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. So brothers and sisters, be uplifted in your spirit because we are the Nazarim, guardians of the precious oil, the mind of Yahuwah, his Torah. And remember, you're going to need that oil on the day of Yahuwah. So little flock, preserve the Torah because as Matt at Yahoo 5 verse 14 says, you are the light of the world. Hallelujah and so be it. We're incognito, Nazarim, with a bird. Yahusha's love in someone else. To see Yahusha's.
Jesus' kingdom on this earth. On this earth. We're incognito, Nazareth, undercover, long lost tribe with a mission. Someone